Hi guys, welcome to this video. This video is about this bad boy that was sat in here. This is the uh, Piper Comanche, which is the latest release from uh, A2A Simulations in their general aviation range of aircraft. Uh, it is AccuSim. If you don't know much about AccuSim, then I would urge you to watch the video I made immediately prior to this one, which is uh, an investigation into AccuSim and what does it add to the flight sim experience. So, what we're going to do is we're going to have a flight sim experience and we're going to use this brand new aircraft and we're going to uh, take it airborne and once we've taken it airborne we're going to see how we get on with it. Uh, but in the meantime we need to have a good look around and have a look at the aircraft as a whole. Now A2A have a very good reputation for making very high fidelity simulations both in terms of the visual aesthetics of the thing inside and outside but also more importantly the functionality and the flight dynamics. Now it's worth noting that Scott at A2A actually owns one of these and therefore I think it would be prudent to make the assumption that every single thing in terms of curves, shapes, colours, nuts, bolts etc is in the right place, the right shape and looks right because if, no, if someone's going to know it will be him. So, one of the things that comes with a lot of A2A aircraft are handy little pop-ups. So here's our little pop-up for our pilot's notes. Uh, we will probably be using that later. I won't be desperately keen to follow the checklist because um, this review isn't about following checklists, it's about the aircraft and fundamentally that's what we're all interested in. I know it's nice to follow the checklist and do everything correctly but it will add time to this video. Time which I would rather not waste just running through a set of uh, tick boxes. I want to get airborne and see how we get on and I want to talk about the aircraft. So that's one of them. Next one you've got is your menus here in terms of control lock and anything that's on. You can choose your GPS, different GPS is available. You can see the channel change, the panel change there. Uh, you can tow your aircraft. So once the brakes are off, you can move it backwards and forwards. Look, you can even change direction. We'll put the brake back on, we'll take that off. Um, so yeah, that's a nice feature. You can adjust your fuel, passengers and oil. We haven't got a lot of fuel. So let's put it up a little bit, make about 10 gallons aside. We don't want it too heavy because we're going to throw it around the sky a little bit in a while. One of my favourite features of the A2A aircraft I have so far flown is this feature. This is like a local map, um, which is really good for finding your, your location quickly without having to use the, uh, the map uh, aspect of FSX, which is not always the greatest thing, but this actually allows you to include lots of little extras like airspace and whatnot. I'm not so worried about um, airspace because uh, if we bust it today, we bust it. It's not like I'm on VATSIM or anything. Uh, quick radios. This is one of the key fundamental bits. This is the hangar and this is uh, an element of AccuSim. AccuSim is not just having an add-on, chucking it in the sky and seeing how it goes. You have to look after it and one of the key elements is the hangar. And not only that, you can tailor the aircraft to your own want. So you can have tip tanks or not, fairings or not, elevators and all of these ch things change the weight, the balance, the performance of the aircraft as a whole. Likewise, how well you maintain the engine, let me just do a quick compression test whilst we're here, will change the performance of the engine and the performance of the engine as a whole so we're fine with that anything that's not green you need to fix anything that's green you don't need to fix you can change your spark plugs look fine wire or massive wire don't quite know how you express massive wire in technical terms maybe that is the technical term I don't know I haven't spoken to an engineer recently engine heater kit well we're in Papua New Guinea at 32 degrees C we don't need that but all of these things are very nice for you know, you can see them actually going on on the aircraft in terms of fairings. Wing root fairings reduce drag. Gear lobe fairings reduce drag. Tip tanks, ironically, can have quite a big impact on drag because what they do is they uh, affect the wingtip vortices. And as a result, they can actually, um, in some aircraft, they will still increase the drag. In others, however, they can have a, a very significant benefit uh, when in, used in terms of uh, their relationship with wingtip vortices. Elevator tips are mass balance tips, so basically what they do is they go on, on the end of the elevator, they have a weight in the front part of them here, and they stop the elevator fluttering up and down if you're in high speed flight. Um, less of an issue at low speed flight. Gap seals go along the wings and flap surfaces to seal the gaps uh, to produce less drag, and uh, yeah, it, it's very nice. The other thing you can do is you can change the prop look. So uh, there's a three blade normal prop, 
And here's a three bay blade composite prop. And I like the composite prop. I just think it looks lovely. And it's constant speed. Um, I did a video about constant speed units, um, variable pitch props, if you wish to have a go and, go and have a look at that. It does help with this control here. This is the prop control. So it does help understand what that is, why it is there, and what to do with it. Without further ado, let's have a look at the inside. Always got lovely little touches as ever. This thing here, this bungee, what it does is it stops the wind catching the ailerons and slamming it against its stops. Now, you have, generally in most aircraft, I don't know what it's like with the Comanche, but you have two stops in terms of the total throw of the controls. The first one is normally here in relation to this control, um, your stick, yoke, whatever you want to call it. Um, which basically means you get to the end of the control range and there's a stop which stops you turning this any further. However, if you force it quickly, you may break that stop, at which point there is generally a second stop in the vicinity of the control surface, which stops that control surface moving too far. If you're in the wind, then there's a good chance that if you didn't have this control lock, um, these things will be allowed to flap around and they will slam against their control stops. The most um, prolific ones are the ailerons, because generally speaking in general aviation aircraft the rudder is linked to the pedals um, quite often it's linked through uh, you know springs or bungees or whatever so there's still a little bit of uh, give there but uh, that's why you have control stops is to stop you damaging your aircraft surfaces in high winds We've got click spots here by the way so you can uh, even without using the shift menu you can uh, get access to your stuff and let's have a quick look around the aircraft now I have no doubt in my mind at all that what is here is supposed to be here. I've got no doubt about that at all. What we are going to do, if I can find it, in fact it's there, we're going to do a walk around. Now, Easy Dock does not always play well with um, the walk around in A2A's aircraft. There is a very simple work around for that. Um, as long as you haven't got out and messed around with the Easy Dock views, what you can do is you can do your walk around in reverse. So here we go. Uh, fuselage, check, lock with key. So we can do that, look, we can lock and we can check it. It's done. It's going to be very quick. Tie downs are gone. Check the uh, hinges, they're all fine. Check all of these. Today's general aviation note of significance are these, the bolts. If you notice, the bolt comes from the top and the nut is underneath with a split pin on the castellations of the nut. Um, the reason for that, when I spoke to Navy engineers many years ago, is obviously not as pertinent on a left-to-right bolt as it is an up-and-down bolt. The up downies are pertinent. If you imagine, if you had enough vibration, let's assume, worst-case scenario, somebody's been doing some maintenance and pulled the little uh, clip out, the R-clip, um, the split pin, however it clips. If you then have vibration over a period of time, it's possible, unlikely but possible, the nut will vibrate itself loose. Now, of course, if it was the other way up and the bolt was at the bottom, once it's worked its way loose, the bolt would just fall out. With the bolt in the top, if, it, if the nut works its way loose, the bolt is still held in that position by gravity. So there is a possibility, and it is a small possibility, however, that the bolt will remain in place adequately that you can land. Of course, the next pilot would then check this and would find the floor and not take off and get it to engineering. Flap the trim tab, it's fine. And this is one of the nice things, statics clear, wriggle the flaps, check the hinges and the control arms, they're all fine. This is your aileron, you can check that for movement. These are the gap seals I was talking about, along here, you see these, which, um, which mean that you can uh, have reduced drag on your surfaces, on your control surfaces. Wing check for damage and check all the connections, they're fine. Wingtip navigation light is fine. Wingtip landing light is fine. Uh, this is the stall warning vane. I can discuss that in a moment, but we will check that that works. Pito heat covers off, and you can check that the pito heat is working. So, let me just go. Let's just do this. I've never done this before. Let's turn that on and turn that on because they're the pito heat switches. Hello, getting a little bit carried away here. Where's my pito heat gone? There it is. Yay, red, because it's warm. Fancy that. Let's go back in here, turn it off before we uh, 
There you go. It's blue if it's not working, red if it is. How spectacularly awesome is that? So there we go. Oh, no, I've broken it now, have I? Oh, no, we're alive. We're still going. OK, so left wing, we've done all of that. Uh, warm to the touch, which it is. Uh, chocks and tie-downs are clear. Fuel levels and fuel quantities. Now, it's quite low. If you look, we've just filled it up, but it's quite low there. So, worth bearing in mind that it does show a visual indication of the level. Oil, you can have simulation. It's gradually going down. A few days ago when I was using it, it was up here. So, it is using and burning oil, which means you do need to check it. Because otherwise you'll run out, the engine will season, it'll all go horribly wrong. OK, checking inlets, they're all clear. Checking the nose and the prop for security, they're all clear. Checking down here in terms of our nose wheel area for inflation and condition and also check the fuel strainer which looks good. If it had water in it you'd see a line where the immiscible liquids aren't mixing so you'd have fuel on top because it's lighter and water on the bottom which is obviously clear and colourless and you've got clear but coloured liquid on top which is fuel. If it comes out as clear colourless it may, may still smell of faintly of fuel but it won't smell strongly of it. That is water. Don't want that. Doesn't burn very well in the engine. Likewise you need to check for sediment. So, there we go. Uh, fuel on that wing, you can see it's not full. And finally, wheels and tyres on that side are all sorted. Inspect that wing light, we don't need to worry about that. That nav light. Uh, flaps, in terms of, uh, you can see, sorry, ailerons connected, all fine and moving. Finally, we get to flaps. They're fine, and all of the control linkages and hinges are fine. So let's have a look at the aircraft. Now, Easy Dock sometimes has a bit of uh, a bit of kittens, depending on the view, as to moving around the aircraft. However, Scott at A2A actually owns one of these bad boys. So the probability of it being absolutely spot-on dimensions-wise, I would suggest is as close to 100% as you are going to get, both internally and externally. Of course, the other advantage of that means that they can pour over the aircraft, so you get some really lovely 3D features, like the aircraft cowling. You can see that the clips override the cowling to lock the top cowling to the underneath cowling. You can see that actually the, uh, the little uh, fasteners are 3D, which is absolutely awesome. It's epic to see that. Lights reflecting off it lovely, it's got a nice 3D effect, you can see the rivet line down here is 3D, um, it's a beautiful effect, it kind of gives it that non-clinical element. Uh, I do apologise about the aircraft in the background, I do have Ultimate Traffic 2 running, I can't see him, uh, I hope it's not him because it would be very loud, it might be him on his APU. But the details on the outside are absolutely st stunning, so you've got your air vents here for, for bringing air into the cabin, you've got your little uh, vanes for uh, stall promotion or aerodynamics effect, depending on why they were added. You've got your uh, stall warning there, and, and you know, uh, what can I say? I mean, look at the lighting here. This is possibly one of the most beautiful things about A2A's aircraft, is the lighting. Now, what I will say is this is in FSX. This is not. This is FSX steam. This is not P3D, and I am quite sure that in P3D it's even better. Uh, P3D is renowned for them. For one thing more than anything else, it's its lighting effects. Now the th oh, there he is. Now the 3D modelling uh, is is just awesome. The temptation with the side of an aircraft is just to have a situation where you can see uh, lines just drawn on, um, with no real 3D depth to them. Um, but you can see that with aircraft panelling, one panel rides over the other and then it's riveted, so it has depth. It's, uh, they don't butt up and produce a perfectly flush line with aluminium-based aircraft. They have exactly this. They have a 3D uh, look to them, which is just fantastic. Um, you know, it, it's the kind of thing where you think, actually, you know, that's a, that's a really high level of attention to detail. You can see that the trim tab moves as you move the control column, which is lovely to see. Um, just moving around. You can see the level of detail here. As I move these controls, you can see that the hinges um, come and go. They're clearly visual in there. So let's have a real close look in. Let's zoom in and see what's going on here. Yeah, you can see the hinges are, are modelled in 3D. Fantastic. Really nice. A little, um, little bit of a bizarre overlap here. You can see it just coming out. But, um, yeah, if you're looking that closely, then uh, 
you're getting a little bit too excited. So uh, that turboprop has just decided to cut his engines to the point where he's probably going to do them damage because there's no wind down. Up on top you've got your anti-collision light, you've got your GPS uh, or is it a GPS? Normally a GPS looks like that. No, it's a vent. Um, and your radio aerials. And it all looks really nice in 3D. Fantastic. Is the exit going to open? Ah, no, it doesn't open. And I'll show you why for a good reason when we get inside. You can see the light dancing off the surface. The top surface of the wing has a th nice 3D uh, effect with the rivets. I'm just going to have a quick look at something. Because I noticed it. You've got a lovely 3D effect. But the rivets, to me, don't look like they're perfectly in line. Yeah, you can see there's a slight difference in the way these things are, are set out here. Um, that kind of thing brings a level of immersion and detail to an aircraft, the likes of which many uh, designers will never really get anywhere close to. So zooming in on the wheel, you can see phenomenal detail. You can see the, uh, the clip here, uh, the R clip, which goes through the, the castellated nut on the wheel axle there, which is just beautiful. Uh, different colourings for the bolts, different lighting effects, uh, good 3D effect on it. Um, just really, really nice overall. I mean, when you can zoom into that level of detail and you can see that, that's just phenomenal. So uh, let's zoom in right in on the scissor link on the front wheel. Excuse my shoddy camera work, it's not my, uh, not my best... Uh, my best skill with this sort of thing. Right. Hopefully you've settled down from the motion sickness. However, you can see here that this nose wheel is just awesome. You've got the only thing that's missing, actually, and it's, it's, a, it's a very small uh, element. It's quite often general aviation ha aircraft have a thing called creep marks. And you have a red mark painted about here on the wheel, which would, you know, be sort of a rectangular affair and you also have a red mark painted on the tyre and what happens is as you land if you imagine you suddenly accelerate the wheel now obviously the tyre wants to accelerate but it will cause some element of potential slip between the tyre and the wheel and these two marks move further apart and if they don't overlap at any point then you need to consider uh, removing and refitting the tyre so lovely effect in terms of the steering damper here a lovely effect for the scissors wheel it's all you know, it, it all looks great. All looks absolutely great. You know, the, the, the level of detail here is, is phenomenal. The level of ability of mind to control the camera is not so. Um, but you can see this is just, you know, the whole setup is just phenomenal. Let's zoom out and go back to a more normal zoom. What am I doing over here? It shows my camera work, doesn't it? So enough for the outside, guys. Um, you know, there really is nothing more to say. Oh, actually, there's going to be two things. I'm just going to check this. It might be that the camera shows a little bit of a, a rubbishness. Right, lovely. Fly splatters. In fact, we'll go over and talk about it on this side. Let's just dive through the aircraft. Fly splatters. These are consistent with a couple, couple of bits here. Right. When you uh, fly an aircraft through the air, obviously part of the air goes over the top, part of the air goes under the bottom. As you increase the angle of attack of the wing, if you imagine the airflow is no longer going here, the airflow is coming from slightly underneath. Now you get a thing called the stagnation point, which is the point at which the airflow has to decide whether it's going over or under. And there's a tiny point where the airflow doesn't move. It can't decide whether to go over or under and you get a stagnation point. Now the stagnation point moves around the leading edge depending on the angle of attack and as you increase the angle of attack this stagnation point where the air streams splitting into the upper and lower half moves around to the under underside of the wing. Now this little tab here, let's see if I can zoom in without making us all feel nauseous, First thing you'll notice, you have more fly splats on the underside of the wing than on the top. That's because, generally speaking, the airflow hits from uh, beneath the leading edge of the wing and then splits, goes over and under. And in effect, what happens is your fly splats balance around this stagnation point that, that generally you hit the flies at. So uh, you can see we've got more splats under than over, which is a really nice feature. The second thing is, um, and the movement of this, as you've seen, is modelled in the actual uh, the walk round. What happens is, as this stagnation point moves, so say it's up here, the airflow is going down. As, the stag as you increase the angle of attack and the stagnation point moves down the leading edge, eventually gets to the point where it's behind 
this little flap. Well, of course, what's happening now is your air is probably coming up from this direction. At the stagnation point, it then splits upper and lower. When it goes upper, it pushes this little flap up against the switch, and that's where you get your stall warning from. So, quite important that when you uh, check your aircraft, you do have a look at that, because ultimately that might be something that saves your life. So we've got another aircraft firing up. So, quick look at the outside, really. Well, I say quick. Um, a rather detailed look at the outside. It is, um, it is phenomenal. The level of detailing uh, is consistent with a lot of A2A's other products. You can see the Perspex, this compound curve here with the lighting. Really nice as you move around. And as I say, this is not P3D. P3D is renowned for its lighting effects. This is FSX, FSX Steam to be exact. So to get this kind of effect on FSX really takes a lot of work and a lot of effort. And you can see how much has gone into this in terms of the lighting on the prop. The blades have different lighting effects. You can see lighter, darker and so on. Um, so without further ado, let's jump in and see how we get on with the inside. Right, so here we are back inside, and uh, what a what a marvellous place it is. Now, AccuSim have for some time been known for the quality and accuracy of their simulations. And if you consider that Scott owns one of these, um, again, we get back into the, the uh, sort of environment of saying, how can I criticise an aircraft where... Um, I have access to one which I haven't yet flown. My, my plan originally was to go and fly it. Um, and then come back and report on it. But I haven't had the opportunity to do that, mainly because I haven't had the money. Um, but Scott flies his. Um, I have no doubt about the, uh, the accuracy of everything that's in here, both geometrically and also in operation. But we will have a look at it and we will see what we think. Okay. There's a few odd anomalies in here, or a few things compared to other aircraft that stand out. Your panel is offset to the right with your radio stack on the left. This makes it interesting for instrument flying, um, particularly with the fact that you've got your ADF is all the way over here. So doing an ADF, uh, an NDB approach would be uh, somewhat um, sporty, I think is the best way of describing it. Now the quality of what's in here is just stunning. If you look at the stitching on the doors, on the vinyl door cards, you look at the 3D effect of the of the poppers going down there, um, you've got your click in, click out things uh, in terms of the airframe itself, uh, sorry, of the aircraft itself. Um, you know, the, you can hear the creaking as the pedals move. Stunning. The textures in terms of this um, this nice sort of cord material, you can see the cords being just pulled out here or, or worn away. Dirt around the bottom of the landing flap lever. And the attention to detail is really quite stunning. Um, have a look at this where the paint is worn away around the, uh, around the navigation light switch. This is an odd switch by the way, because it's first position puts nav lights on and then the rest of it changes the intensity of the instrument lights. So uh, it's one of those switches where when it was designed it was obviously designed with the principle that well you know if you uh, if you need your navigation lights on you're probably at night and if you're at night or low visibility you need your nav not lights on. So interesting switch I've not come across that before. Switches all have different noises So, you know, the attention to detail is phenomenal. Levers make noises, switches make noises, everything makes noises, clunks, creaks, groans, does whatever it's expected to do. So all things told, um, there's a very large attention, amount of attention to detail has gone into this. Things like Piper's doors, Piper aircraft, I don't know any general aviation Piper aircraft other than some of their turboprop or very large ones um, which don't have this door arrangement. I'm sure that somebody will be able to point out to me. I mean, I know the Piper Cub um, doesn't have this door arrangement and lots don't. But in this layout, the low-wing monoplane uh, single-engined aircraft, even Sen Senecas and Seminoles have this kind of door arrangement, which are uh, general aviation light twins. Got to unlock it before the handle works. You get the click from the uh, check strap, and then once it's closed, do the lock at the top, pull it in nice and tight and snug. Um, and that's exactly the same. That's exactly the level of detail which um, here you go. Look, 
The gear light is green, nice and bright. As soon as I turn the nav lights on, it makes the assumption you're at night and it dims it. it dims these lights up here as well, look. Or maybe it doesn't. I thought it did for a moment there. Test these, press to test, very nice. Uh, the reason I've turned that on is to have a look at the lighting over here. Two different lights. Nice bright storm light, so if you're setting everything up you've got a nice bright storm light. But you don't really want that night flying. What you want is a much mellower red light, so you get a good view of your instruments. And I know you've got your instrument uh, instrument lights specifically, but you get a good overall look at the panel with that. Really nicely done. Of course the other thing is, it lights that end really well. That end not so well. You can see the fading of the light coming in, which is a lovely feature. Um, you've also got a light at the back which works. Reading light for the uh, for the passengers. But all told, the inside is just beautiful. Instruments wise, one of my pet hates is when you can't read the instruments. These are all lovely and crystal clear. The only exception to that is the uh, is the HSI. But that's more by virtue of the fact the numbers on it are so close together. So yeah. Yeah, beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. But what's noticeable is, as you zoom in, they don't lose any clarity. They don't go woolly or anything like that. You can see the details around the edge here. Um, Rochester gauges incorporated of Texas, Dallas, USA. Dial number, blah. Beautiful, really nice. Um, multiple layers as well, so you can see you've got the outside ring and then you've got um, sort of the lubber line, top and bottom. Uh, you've got your little arrow for your OBS for to from and you've got the needles overlaying on top of the uh, of the deviation division markers there and it, just superb superb really really nice level of detailing on the instruments one of the things I like the clock actually ticks it's not smooth movement the, the attention to detail has gone into the tiniest things bizarrely tiny tiny things um, so yeah I'm not going to hang around in here because um, the eye candy the bling sh talks for itself really um, you know you guys can see what it's uh, what it's all about actually what I am going to do is I'm going to pop outside for a particular thing something that really impressed me this is a composite bladed prop look at the curvature on the prop here they've modeled the prop beautifully in terms of the curvature of the aerofoil as you move around it. Beautiful, beautiful bit of work. Absolutely stunning. Really is. And the fasteners, the 3D fasteners, the light, the way the light dances off it. Look at that. I mean, that is gorgeous. I defy you to tell me that that's not gorgeous. But bear in mind, this is FSX it's in. FSX Steam Edition. This is not P3D. P3D's renowned for its lighting effects its shadows its shading look at all of this stuff dancing off the surfaces okay so let's get this thing started and let's get airborne then so uh, nothing around us to affect at the minute all doors and hatches are closed so uh, let's fire it up first things first get the uh, get the first big switch on stick the rotating beacon on and all looks good all the gauges are looking good need to get some fuel pressures so we'll pop that on just stick the mixture fully rich. Wait for the fuel pressure to rise. Which it is doing. Turn that off. Make sure that's fully forward closed. We will do a couple of squirts. It is 30 degrees however, so I can't imagine that we're going to need any more than that. So that's all done. Just crack the throttle open a bit. Thinking about it, there we go. There we go, that's better. Now, let's get the rest of this thing fired up. And that's pretty much as good to go. Let's make sure we idle about 1000 RPM. What we'll do is we'll warm the engine up by uh, taxiing. We'll taxi over to runway 14 left, no, 14 right, my apologies. Um, I do have Active, active Sky Next uh, running, which uh, the wind is variable at 3, so uh, as long as we don't crash into anything, I'm going to choose 14 right because it's the closest. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's just turn the nav lights on. 
which with it for some bizarre reason brings on the instrument lights I really don't know why that's linked but there we go uh, Squawking 7000 will set the QFE now the QFE for those who aren't familiar with it is a pressure setting that's commonly used in the UK um, and basically what it is it's the altimeter pressure setting uh, which uh, when related to a datum gives you the height above that datum so in this case it's going to be the height above the airfield elevation um, I think the airfield elevation is only about 200 feet but nonetheless um, I'll use that as my reference so that when I come back to do my circuit I know all I need to do is read, read a thousand with that and we're good to go okay top tip for today just make sure before you taxi um, or before you change your uh, brakes so if you're going to brake make sure your engine's idling likewise if you're going to release your brakes the whole point is that the, the prop is trying to pull the brakes are trying to stop the last thing you want to be doing is pulling and stopping when you can avoid it so just before we taxi we can bring the throttles back to idle release the brakes now the brakes are clear and taxi around to the left and away we go. Now this doesn't seem to uh, to be affected quite as badly by the... Uh, what we'll do is we'll put the headset on. There we go. This doesn't seem to be as badly affected by the FSX ground bug as some aircraft. It seems to be okay to taxi um, even, with, uh, even with that sort of stickiness. So you can see we're taxiing, we're only doing 1150 in terms of RPM. Uh, 11,500 okay bring it to a halt then we reintroduce the power not too much don't want to go too aggressively with it okay so the aircraft taxis really nicely actually it's uh, it's a very nice uh, change rather than this lurch that you quite often get um, and those familiar with F FSX will know the lurch I mean where you have to apply lots of power to get going and then the thing races away from you um, but there we go so we've got our HSI set up with a runway heading so uh, that will give us some useful uh, reference material for where we're going we can stick the strobe lights on the landing lights will stick the fuel pump on ready for takeoff check the check the mixture mic 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 check the mixture mixture is fully rich prop fully forward and we need to make sure that the uh, that's closed a quick round to the left round to the right make sure no one's going to crash into us I do have ultimate traffic running but with the wind being three knots variable there's no guarantee it's actually going to do what it's supposed to do um, and listen to where I'm going so we'll do rolling takeoff make sure we've got first stage flat looking to rotate at 85 climb out in theory at 105 if we get straight enough and quick enough we'll do a rolling takeoff if not we'll swan around on the airfield and uh, hopefully somebody will take pity on us so there we go okay with the prop I'm expecting it to go nose to the left however with the wind uh, we shouldn't have too much problem to be crabbing quite a bit down the road. maybe that's just a visual perspective 85 smartly off cycle the gear Now the gear is a three position switch. What that means is that uh, when you lift the gear up, if you just press the gear button, as you would do with most normal aircraft, um, the switch moves one position. So in that case, I'm from down to off, and I needed to press the switch again, or going all over the place. I needed to press the switch again to get the gear to go up. If you don't do that, it can prove a trifle embarrassing on occasions. Climbing out on 105, we'll just. Uh, sidle over this way a little bit, get away from the airfield. So what we're going to do now is we're going to clean up, flaps up and we'll fly a cruise climb at 120. So what we'll also do whilst we're at it is we will throttle back, bring the revs down, 24 squared, which is our cruise configuration, and then we can reintroduce a bit of power again. Back to 24 squared. And just tweaking a little bit. Not going to mess around with the mixture. 
of the nice things when I did the AccuSim video, um, I showed that you can actually uh, trim this, uh, not trim it, you can actually um, mix, uh, lean the mixture right here, which is nice. So 120, this is it, hands off, flying, beautiful thing to fly. It does exactly what you say on the tin, climbing at what, uh, 1400 feet a minute? Be at 4000 feet in no time at all. Um, but I haven't touched the controls for the last 30 seconds. Beautiful. People do say that they reckon that the. Um, it's just showing a little bit of a turn to the right. I wonder if that's the weather. No attempt to recover, so let's just pop a little bit of left. Give it a hand. Um, still hands off the stick. No reason to be hands off the stick at this point. Got to be careful what you do with your stick. But anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, there's no need to, uh, to get too excited about the trim with this, although people have said on the forums it's a bit slow. Actually, for me, I don't mind it being slow, because in reality you should be fairly close to flying in trim anyway, and if you are, all you need is mild adjustments. Uh, but I'd rather have a slow but accurate trim, which makes it easier to trim the aircraft out, than a quick, inaccurate trim. You know the one where you just press the button and it lurches around, a low cloud. Thank you very much, Active Sky. Next, um, that's just great. That is. I was going to uh, hopefully get a patch of clear air. So we're at 4,000. What we'll do is we'll just investigate the handling. 30 degree angle of bank turn. We'll just let the nose drop so the, uh, the VSI is not climbing. A little bit of back pressure on the stick. Beautiful 30 degree angle of bank turn. I say beautiful, I took my eye off the ball there and it leapt up to about 400 feet a minute rate of climb. Mess around with the power, that's my, uh, that's my fault. Right, we're quite quick. Nice crisp aileron response, as you'd expect. Nice quick elevator response. And a very nice rudder response, yeah. A bit wallowy on the rudder, a bit more, a bit less crisp, but then if I put full power, let's see if that makes a difference, get the slipstream going. Yeah, it's quick, it's much crisper with the slipstream. Let's take all the power off the rudder and see what happens with the slipstream then. No slipstream effect now. Yeah, it, it is a bit woolly, a bit slower. Nice to see that there's a difference. Okay, next thing we're going to look at is the effect of the engine. The engine obviously a massive great big um, massive great big gyroscope on the front, so it has quite an impact on the aircraft, a bit of a jolt in the air then. So let's have a look at what impact. Let's take the power off. Nose drops, not really doing a lot. Put the power on, nose rises, goes to the left, and then sorts itself out again. Power off. I'm using this as a reference here. Nose drops, but it doesn't really go away to the right. Power on. Yeah, it goes to the left. So you can see that it is uh, replicating some of the effects of... Um, the effects of the engine in terms of its effect. It's not really replicating anything in terms of torque, I have to say. So if I demonstrate that, we'll just uh, we're quite high because we're going to do some spins and uh, stalls in a minute. Um, it's not really reflecting anything in uh, in torque. You can see as I put the throttle back and forth. I've got all my simulation realism settings set to maximum. So um, beyond that, nice crisp roll rate. What we'll do is we'll do a steep turn. 45 degrees is the minimum for a steep turn. Oh, lovely, steep turn in a cloud. This is going to be a bit interesting. Let's go up to uh, 60 degrees. Let's see how we get on. Shouldn't be doing this. Should be doing rate 1, no more than 30, 35 degree angle of bank in a cloud. But let's see how we get on. 60 degree level angle of bank turn. We're not far off it. 2G pull on this, by the way. See it bumping around in the cloud. Let's do an upset recovery. See the stall light come on there? Okay, what do we got? Airspeed's rising, altitude is decreasing. Close the throttle because we're going down fast. Roll level and then pull. Pull, pull, pull before you get to the NE. That's it. Upset recovery complete. Just going to let it uh, decay the speed, climb it up a bit more. Right. This is ominous. We're in the middle of cloud. 
So, oh, there we go, we've popped out again. What we'll do is a quick um, stall. We'll do a clean stall and then a dirty stall. One of the things I uh, pointed out in a previous video is that there's a difference between a 1G stall and an accelerated stall. The accelerated stall is where you pull. And what happens is the airspeed... It's not happy. Actually, we've just done a loop. We're not cleared for arrows, so that's a bit of an interesting one. But the accelerated stall is where, in effect, rather than allowing the 1G stall, you pull into it. So let's let the uh, airspeed decay. We'll do it by just converting speed to height. And then as we get to 100 knots, this is interesting the way we're dashing in and out of cloud. We'll pull. Now you can see the stall light came on. We're still at 100 knots, but the stall light came on well in advance. 3,000 feet. I tell you what, we'll do. We've just done a clean accelerated stall. Get up. do while we're climbing you can see the speed's dropping down quite significantly we don't want to go too slow mind but what we can do is we can investigate the slow speed handling perhaps I can get somewhere to flip it see out the cloud we're right in the clag aren't we we're right in the clag ourselves a bit, um, a bit clear of that cloud. That was horrendous for what we're planning to do, because what we're planning to do is some stalls. So we're going to do a 1G stall, uh, and it should be fairly chilled, it should be fairly relaxed. Right, speed's coming down. What we're trying to do is maintain our vertical speed uh, at zero, at or as close to zero as we can get. And what we would expect or anticipate is a very woolly nondescript stall that uh, that just gradually and in you know very insidious in its arrival and see how the aircraft behaves with that and there's the stall warning light a bit of bumping no particular wing drop I've still got some control with the ailerons I wouldn't want to use too much and I've still got some control with the rudder but it's going into that wallowy mushing thing that we'd expect so stall recovery release the back pressure full power, so the torque and yaw effect there from the engine, which is nice. Have a dirty stall now. So there we go. Now I'm hoping it can demonstrate some sort of wing drop here. Full warning anyone? There it is. There it goes. Close the throttle, stop further yaw with the pedal. That's an important thing. The reason we close the throttle is we got into, that was an incipient spin where we came very nose down. When you're doing your training, what, uh, what they generally do for a dirty stall is they will say to recover at the any um, at the first indication of a stall. So that could be the stall warning, it could be the rumbling, um, sloppy handling, uh, or, or loose or you know indefined handling would not be it. But let's get ourselves here and in effect the recovery would be as follows. Let's just let the uh, vertical speed come down a bit. Right, there we go, first indication of the stall. So you go to full power and release the back pressure to let the aircraft just uh, drive itself out. What we do need to do now, however, is get rid of the gear. 
get rid of all of that because what we're going to do now is we're going to do a spin to get down to altitude nice and quickly. Get down to the altitude we want. We'll do it to the left and we'll go for three turns initially, possibly four. There's a stall warning, there's a bump. Feed in full rudder, keep the ailerons neutral. One, two, three, we'll go for four. Four, full opposite rudder. Neutral aileron, stick forwards to break it and then uh, to break the stall for the wing. Right, let's see where we are. Because basically, in a spin, what's happening is you're uh, just like the other flight pro procedures, you're in a stall. It's just that one wing's stalled and the other one isn't. Right. Not that one. Not that one. Which reminds me. Yeah, we do need some fuel. Okay. This is one of the neat things about this uh, about this map look. The white arrow is where you're headed. Obviously you can see I'm just going to come through about another 10 degrees and I'll be pointing right at the airfield. So the airfield's over here. Really, really nice feature. Okay. So we've done clean stalls, dirty stalls, spins. We've done a bit of in cloud. Uh, we've done... Let me see, what else have we done? We've done steep turns left and right. Um, what we haven't done is high-speed handling near VNE. And then we'll go in and we'll land. So what are my general thoughts on the flying capabilities of this thing? Uh, you need to use your feet. You need to use your trim. Uh, you need to understand what the aircraft is trying to do. You need to be able to interpret it. Um, all of which are skills that you would in effect, well not in effect, actually need for real life. And this is one of the things that makes this, for me, really quite a nice aircraft. You can hear the wind noise. Increasing because we're increasing speed. We're getting up, um, we're beyond our max maneuvering speed, so you should be uh, very careful when you're maneuvering at this sort of speed. What you should be doing is loops, of course. Unintentional, but I was trying to prove the point it kept pulling. Unfortunately, when I tried to prove the point it kept pulling, we went all the way over the top. Pull the throttle off, look at the nose drop. Look at that. Right, we're going to do a base leg joint. the airfield over there. This is why that yellow arrow is quite useful now, is because I can get uh, an appreciation as to the orientation of the airfield. So 150 for gear. down we're still high we are quite some distance away okay so let's just check props fully forward mixtures in everything else is fine good to go you can see the airfields coming in on the right we'll do a landing to uh, now we need to get down to about 110 next stage of flat should give us an extra bit of drag Now what we're going to do is we're going to fly to the 1-4 uh, right touchdown, aiming with that, with a constant position for that. So get the speed down, we're now down at 110, trim, 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 trim. We're looking for 105 until we turn on to finals. I don't know if you heard the trim wheel squeaking there, that was quite surreal, it was almost like we had mice in the cockpit. One of the difficulties I always find compared to real life is uh, adjusting your turning position. Take uh, full flaps now because we're quite high. One of the things uh, that that is prevalent on the forums is people commenting on. Uh, let's just do a bit of a slip, get ourselves down a bit quicker. People commenting on how this thing floats. It does float, and it floats because it's got a low wing monoplane structure. Um, so what that means is that basically you've got a cushion of air that sits underneath the wing. Right, we're coming back into a good profile now. Just need to get back on centre line now after all that shenanigans. But what that basically means is that um, if you're not at the right speed, you're generating too much lift, but you're also generating quite a big ground cushion under the aircraft. 
so just five knots too slow now but we're still slightly high so we can bring that back a bit and of course the problem is you've then got to bleed off that lift somehow and the way you bleed off the lift is to make sure that you are not too fast so 90 knots is the approach speed for this I'm quite happy with this at the minute I'm going to let it bleed to 85 over the fence keeping a constant sight picture for where we're going to touch down I'm keeping the numbers right in the middle of the cowling at the minute bleed bled over to 85 over the fence as we come over now maintain the attitude gentle flare with the throttle closed a bit high might balloon not pretty but we're down and uh, yeah delightful handling absolutely glorious plane to fly um, the stall and spin behaviour is pretty much what you'd ex expect the control harmonies and responses are pretty much what you'd expect um, everything's everything's there it's it's hard to find criticism with this thing um, certainly in the flying qualities as I say people do go oh it, it floats uh, every aircraft floats to some greater or lesser extent it's just that some float more than others um, those of you who've tried learning to fly in a 172 will know that that can float if you have your speed too high because you will no doubt have had a nervous instructor next to you um, trying to instruct you in how not to smash the nose well off the ground in your desperate rush to get down on it. In, a, in overall, I suppose in summary, the systems work really well. The aircraft is beautiful to look at. I haven't found any significant flaws that I can find in the systems. Um, I have found one tiny, tiny, tiny flaw in the external modelling, which I'll show you in a second. Um, but really that's that's where it is and finally um, handling yeah it behaves exactly as I would expect it to do the only thing I noticed when we were just flying is that when there was significant throttle change there didn't seem to be any particular uh, torque effect from the engine it, it remained wings level with no input from me at all so um, you know with that in mind that's a bit of a question mark for me it stalls very nicely. I know people are sort of like, oh well, you know, such and such a simulator doesn't stall. This does. It, it produces a decent wing drop. Uh, you have to use your rudder to counteract it. Um, it will spin. It takes a bit of effort to get into the spin, but then that's quite common with a lot of GA aircraft because they're uh, built in a natural, uh, with a natural amount of stability in them just drive over here, we'll park over here, but they have a natural amount of stability to them which means sometimes uh, the aircraft can be a little bit difficult to uh, to spin. The problem is if you make a stable aircraft once it's in the spin it can be a little bit of a bugger to get out of a spin again. Um, so yeah, it, it, that varies massively dependent on the aircraft, uh, massively dependently on the aircraft and, and the different sort of aircraft. So we'll just park ourselves over here because uh, we're not really interested in following too many airport procedures because there's nobody else here. Even though I've got Ultimate Traffic 2 running, but there's not many people. Clouds are building, look at that. Got to enjoy uh, Active Sky next. Oh, it seems to be coming down to uh, down to ground level again. So what we'll do is we'll just shut ourselves all down. Close, 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 close. And obviously one of the things not to forget with this is persistent modelling. If you uh, if you leave it turned on, it will potentially drain your battery if you've got your master switch on and you won't be able to start it again. Don't need that. We're going to leave that on. Pull the throttles fully back. Mixture fully back. Wait for it to stop. Keys out. Master switch off. Can take the headset off now. Um, the headset is quite important because um, it does cut down on the background noise. So you can start it with uh, with it being fairly quiet and then you can uh, obviously sort out your background noise. Um, it's important for me, bizarrely, when I'm recording, because ultimately when the engines are going it can be too loud. So I can stick that on and uh, it quietens it down and then it's not too bad with the voice. So what's the summary? The summary really, if you like GA aircraft, go and buy it. End of. Simple as that. Whilst I think about it, I will point out the single solitary flaw that I have encountered and it is just simply the rudder. The uh, the rudder hinges. You see how they stick through here? They just poke through the textures for the wing slightly. You can see that there's a solid line there and as soon as it goes it comes. That's all I can find guys. 
that's it. I mean, I'm sure there's more problems. Um, I just can't find them. And if there's nothing else, that is an indicator of the quality of this product. Um, and I recommend it to you wholeheartedly. If you have the money and you like GA flying, this is a fascinating and excellent quality aircraft to add to your hangar. And with that, folks, I will leave you. If you did enjoy the video, please don't forget to tick like, share or subscribe. And I shall see you all soon. Take care.